welcome to the 91st Airhex TV with the following topics. So uh, let's uh, let's do this. So what I will start with is um, BCR design, BCE design. So what happened here? Um, I just updated the template to lit HTML 2.0 library and it worked well. So there were no issues. So it was very easy. I actually forgot <laughs> how to update the dependencies and it was easier than I thought. So what I just did, I uh, updated to lit HTML 2.0 and also updated to the recent, uh, to the recent uh, Redux toolkit. Okay. So, um, this was that. Then the next thing is two new uh, GitHub projects. One is called uh, AWS CDK Plane and the other one AWS Lambda CDK Plane. And, um, and the, um, what is CDK stands for Cloud Development Kit. And what you can do, you can set up with Java the, uh, the AWS Cloud. And let's take a look at that. And um, I also... Uh, recorded a YouTube screencast, screencast where you can watch it. And um, so this is the plain template and the other one, I, uh, I just extracted it from one of my projects. It is based on the AWS CDK plane, but it also contains Lambda. And usually the CDK from AWS will set up the entire project for you, but it generates more code. So what I did, I generated it once and clean it up a bit and then uh, publish it to, uh, to uh, GitHub. So nothing revolutionary, but uh, good enough or still helpful. Okay, uh, next one. These are actually the questions. And before we go to the questions, uh, go to the podcast. So there are a couple of podcasts again. So, um, and um, one was about uh, the Graal VM was uh, exciting uh, or exciting, uh, was fun. The other one with um, uh, one of the um, guests, Matthias Juric, uh, about Kubernetes, Cumulus E, relation to microprofile and a little bit more history about the microprofile runtime. And uh, then uh, humans over computers with uh, Teresa, I forgot how to pronounce it correctly. Um, I, I would say Nguyen, which is completely wrong, but I, practiced that in the podcast. And uh, so I met her the service head conference a year, year ago and uh, she worked for Tommy, Tommy Tribe and now for Microsoft Asia. So it was a fun conversation. Okay, so let's uh, start with the first question from the chat. And the first question from the chat is from, Yulis, uh, from uh, Luis Galas. And uh, he is not only a... Uh, Rec uh, returning guest for, for Airhex TV. He's also Airhex Live alumni. And he asked me, you know, Apache Poi. What is Apache Poi? It's just pure object interface. This is the uh, library from Apache, which is able to read uh, and write uh, Microsoft Office documents. Uh, really helpful. Use it also in the past. And the uh, Apache Poi, uh, how, to, how, to, how can it be packaged with the server? So um, I don't know which server you are using. If this is Whitefly, Glassfish, or Payara, usually they have a lib folder, so you can put it there. So what you will do in a Docker environment, you would create an image with this library inside, and then uh, and then just um, have the super image, then inherit from the image and ship the application. So this is what what I would do. And if you have something like Quarkus, so there are less options. It can, it has to be. Uh, dependency, but we can also do. You can also have a multi-layered, multi-layered uh, Quarkus image where, in the super layer, you can you can generate, you know, the empty Quarkus image once with all the dependencies, and you poi and then inherit from that. So there is no difference because Quarkus from the beginning separates between the um, infrastructure and the and the business logic. So um, this is what uh, what I would do uh, with Quarkus is a little bit uh, more problematic because uh, we'll come to that later because Quarkus dependency, uh, if you have a plain depend dependency, it is not optimized and Quarkus optimizes the dependencies with with the extensions actually. So uh, first question answered. So, um, and where is the Twitter? Here is the Twitter, okay. Uh, you can ask me questions via Twitter and you can ask me questions uh, via the YouTube chat built in. So this is going to be here. 
Maybe we can do it on one. Put it on one screen. Oh, nicer. Okay, this is our interaction interaction screen. So, um, so this was the uh, podcast. And by the way, what I did, um, I was able to turn on some statistics. So what I'm able to track how often the podcast is downloaded. So it's completely anonymous. I'm not even tracking IP addresses, nothing, but how often it is downloaded, whether you listen to podcasts or not, um, I don't know, but uh, it is uh, surprising. So uh, the a fresh epi episode gets uh, downloaded um, roughly two and a half thousand uh, times a week. So this is a fresh episode. And I think there's like 13,000 uh, downloads per week from everything. And um, so I will track a little bit. Um, I'm just watching these stats for, or I, I looked at this <laughs> once and turned it on uh, a few weeks ago. But it is um, surpri surprisingly high traffic. And I, I wouldn't expect that. So this is, uh, the, you know, the history repeats. The, the same happened on my blog with X-Ray. Okay, so now um, this was the podcast story. And now maybe the very first question. And the question is, um, what is your recommendation uh, to write JPA queries using native SQL queries? So uh, the, the, the first question is why you would like to write native SQL queries. So um, usually, um, so what could be the reason? The reason could be that you are an excellent Oracle, Postgres, or MySQL, uh, how to call it, developer, yeah? And you don't like the JPA query exceptions or the, and you would like to write native queries. In this particular case, I would just use the native queries. Because, um, because you know, um, switching from one database to another is this unlikely event, I would say. And if you will have to switch, usually the databases behave completely different. So then just go ahead and write the native queries. And uh, I would use the named native queries why this? Because of uh, JPA QL injection, and um, and um, and yeah, this is basically it. And um, I try to avoid the criteria queries. I don't like them. This is how this is the. I always have you know. I never, I'm never able to write them from scratch. I have to think you know how to construct them. And this is um, yeah. And, and then then I'm right. It's not nat It comes not natural to me. But uh, the uh, criteria queries are great if you, if the number of where parameters varies. So if you have like a form, so you can do it on the fly with criteria queries. So I personally write JPA QL queries because usually my queries are simple. And uh, in most projects, we have some exceptions where you use name, name native queries. Um, so I think your approach is a good approach. And, um, and what you could also do, I don't know whether you thought about that, you could uh, fire up a JPA QL query or native query and render the result into a um, Java object. And what should work, um, it should also work with Java records. Because uh, I think even the old JPA should, should recognize a new Java record as a constructor. So, uh, and the chat goes crazy. So um, let's see, something happens here, I see. Uh, Brett, Ta Brett Tucker, this is the old friend of the show. He also attended the origin airhex.com and he tried in, uh, I wanted to say Louisiana, not Louisiana, in Utah to, uh, to uh, mock or how to call it, to simulate the German glu Glühwein. So, and uh, Brett Tucker asked me, hello, it's been a long time. I managed to catch one of these. Okay, I thought you have a question. So uh, thank you for, for, for coming back. And yes, bring Larsen, ask me, sorry, Jazz, not Jens, Jazz, bring Larsen, ask me, what's in Java 70 are you most excited about? Actually nothing, because I already used Java 16. The most exciting thing for me, and this was very similar, is the LTS. So I'm using Java 17 everywhere, and, and, and this was like Java 11, you know, all the, between Java 11 and 17, I used various JDKs, 14, 15, it was a mess, I used whatever I found just for me, but in my clients, I always use Java 11, and now we'll try, you know, to upgrade to Java 17. It's not, not always that easy, because AWS Lambda runs on Coreto 11, and uh, Asia the same, Asia functions were recently up upgraded to Java 11, so, um, yeah. Um, so I would, um, okay, but let's, let's say 16 and 17. Um, I, uh, 
I don't even know what is now Java 17 features. But what I like is the uh, multi multi line um, uh, string. Um, I don't even know whether it was available in Java 11. I don't think so. <laughs> and then uh, the var were available in Java 11. And um, what else? So I have to think about uh, what's actually in Java Java 17. What's unique in Java 17? Um, HTTP client was Java 11? This is a good question. You know, what makes me excited in, J in Java 17? The multi-line string, I think what would, what, would, uh, what I'm waiting for is the um, instance of pattern matching. So this is a bigger deal because um, I, I have to deal with JSON more and more. And this will simplify the uh, extraction from, from JSON objects. So this, um, but this is in preview right now, so, uh, but, but, but it's nice. Uh, Jans, Jans Kunzmann asked me, uh, sorry, <laughs> Jan Kunzmann asked me, do you use Quarkus in production? Or what are your thoughts about Mutiny? So I use uh, Quarkus in production and I don't use Mutiny because in most projects, uh, projects, um, hey chat, this is actually great. So I don't have to prepare with a question. This is way, way better. Um, so uh, I don't use Mutiny in production because I don't have the use case for Mutiny. And what Mutiny would be is like, uh, you know, I have uh, many synchronous Jaxorus resources and I would like to coordinate them. I don't have such use cases. And if I use, let's say, Kafka, I, I go with Kafka streams or uh, reactive messaging from micro profile. Um, yeah. Uh, React or Prime Faces, I would say uh, React is great. Web components with lit HTML are similar without framework. So uh, web components on Prime Faces, I would say for boring uh, back office applications, Prime Faces still shines regarding productivity. Um, so you can very, very quickly create something. And if you know, if you delete it in a few months, no one cares. <laughs> And uh, with web components and lit HTML, you can create a great um, offline apps. Okay, then I hope I hope I answer this question. And um, perfect. So Christian Frey, uh, Frey, and I know the name. Uh, and by the way, uh, this was the trick, right? This is Juan. Uh, Pika from Uruguay, crazy. Uh, Montevideo. Uh, Montevideo is a great name. I don't know why. Montevideo sounds great. So, um, uh, great, uh, great name of 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 uh, of the city. Um, so, um, so back to you. If you like native SQL and everyone in your team like native SQL, go ahead and write native SQL. Be careful with constructing dynamic queries on the fly because of JPAQL. And even if you are very cautious. Code reviews are terrible because you always have, you know, to see how the, how the, or oh, terrible, complex, because you have uh, closely watch um, how the queries are constructed. And um, yeah. And Juan uh, is in the chat and said, uh, thanks, Adam. So it seems like uh, you are happy. And uh, I would experiment with Java records so you can, uh, you know, fetch the results and render them to Java records. So, uh, Christian Fry, and Christian Fry, he likes um, the BCE web standards examples in our company. So thank you for promoting that. And uh, something happened because in the recent recent weeks, I got more and more feedback that this is actually used in various projects, which I was really surprised because uh, the template was there. There's like 40 stars, so it's not like you know 40,000 stars, uh, but it seems to be used, which. Uh, Makes me a little bit happy because it means I'm not the only crazy who who doesn't uh, use framework. And by the way, um, recent in a uh, recently in a in a custom uh, workshop, there were developers who look at the BCE uh, template and ask me what would be the reason to to use a framework. And I and I thought about that. It's like it's really hard to tell. And also nice, uh, a student approached me with uh, he creates how is it called semi structural survey. To uh, to use uh, web uh, to develop web uh, applications without frameworks, and we had a chat, and I asked him if the survey is done. Uh, he will uh, come to the AHX FM podcast, and uh, I will have a chat with him about that. And he also asked me, you know, what would be the reason to use a framework? And I say I have no idea. So uh, except of course if you have React uh, and uh, React Fiber is crazy fast with. 
with the updates. Okay, uh, the main argument is they want to use TypeScript. And by the way, if you use a BC design template and uh, you have Visual Studio Code, what Visual Studio Code will do, it will it reads ES6, but actually it thinks this is TypeScript. So in kind of, you are actually using TypeScript actually. Um, and um, I don't know whether you tried that out, but uh, I would say the uh, code completion is actually excellent for ES6. Um, yeah, we don't need uh, TypeScript. I, this is also my opinion. And I, I see more and more, uh, on, uh, more and more. There were already some tweets where where developers said, you know, TypeScript is too complicated. They're going back to JavaScript, so you can go. But um, what you could do, absolutely, you can use BCE design template with TypeScript. I, I don't think it's necessary, but you could absolutely do this. Um, ah, we get a uh, very important uh, information from from the YouTube and says Montevideo is not away from Elephant Island. Um, yeah, this is a uh, important hot news. So perfect. So now we have you know the uh, this is the back channel conversation here. So now <coughs> and here sorry he even says uh, BC GitHub project is pure gold. So amazing. Um, so. Next question from Christian is, what's your opinion on microservice communication with both REST and GMS available in your system landscape? Um, very interesting. So um, as you probably know, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of microservices. I never got them really. I mean, you know, the idea of, of deploying uh, a small, you know, pieces of, of almost like command pattern around the world and hoping it is going to be better. So what we're actually doing more and more, we are merging the microservices back back to almost monolith, because uh, if you use BCA, BCE design pattern in the backend, uh, for me it's very important that you know the logical grouping or modularization is done right, and um, and I on, only you know uh, creating microservices to have a truly isolated standalone modules. And um, so, well, back to your thing is, so if you have such, you know, standalone microservices, I would let them communicate via via REST because usually uh, you always have to expose REST because of the client. JMS is unusual uh, in, in such a case. Um, what I think what can happen is, I would say this actually... If you like, join the keynote a little bit. Uh, this is the uh, keynote, what a startup would do, uh, JCon keynote tomorrow. Where is it? Uh, yeah, exactly. This is um, uh, 6 to 7 uh, p.m. tomorrow, CET, what, what would a startup do? And what I, try, what, what I would um, explain a little bit different architectures. And um, one thing is, um, is to think about what what's you know the the persona or the actor is it the actor a web application request response then i will go with uh, with uh, first you know think about microservices but if the uh, actor main actor or main persona are uh, devices then maybe uh, event driven architectures are the the most appropriate thing and then i wouldn't use gms i would rather do something like kinesis kafka or apache pulsar where uh, it's not about messages, it's about persistence and events. And JMS, I would say this is a spe special kind of, uh, of communication. And, you know, we don't have to time to discuss it because we spent actually the entire day at, I think, last year, the EHEX Live, just about this topic. But uh, I think the main distinction, the distinction between JMS and Kafka is in JMS, you're sending messages and you exactly know who... Uh, who will receive the message. So the idea of JMS is you're sending from one microservice to another microservice the message, right? And, um, and the idea of, um, of, uh, of Kafka or event uh, architectures is the event is created and you have no idea who will consume the event. It's just, you know, egoistic point of view. I'm the machine, I'm the user, and I'm just, you know, capturing the state of my... <laughs> of my world and storing in somewhere in a topic like a database and and this is the main idea so um yeah this is th th this are both you know um both architectures and uh, you shouldn't mix them so um now let's see uh vano beritza from uh 
Tbilisi, uh, Georgia almost, <laughs> it's not Georgia, it's Georgia. <laughs> Do you think Jakarta in microprofile caucus will grab some market share from Spring in the near future? No idea. Um, I think it already happens. I mean, some, it happens, of course. Everything grabs, you know, Quarkus uh, uh, Spring uh, market share because if someone uses Quarkus, it, it, she or he doesn't use, you know, uh, um, Spring. But uh, what's, what's, what's interesting is I got actually today a tweet from friend of the show, Mr. Kostlov, and he was also on the podcast. Let's see how this works. Now, oh, so here is the tweet, and from uh, Eric DeAndrea, and Mr. Kostlov reviewed a book, and I don't have the book, but I took a look on that, and this is different story. Let's say here book. So uh, and this is book review, Quarkus for Spring Developer. This is a very new one. No idea. I, I think the book is good because it was uh, reviewed by Eric Koslov, and it seems like, uh, I mean, uh, it's interesting. So, but if someone writes a book, Quarkus for Spring Developers, something seems to happen, you know? Interesting, right? So, I mean, and um, in uh, I also did some workshop, Cloud Native workshop, for Spring developers, it's a longer story. But uh, and I said, okay, I have no idea about Spring, so I will just show you Quarkus, and it doesn't matter because in the cloud usually you don't need frameworks, so we can use Quarkus, Pojos, or whatever you like. And they became curious, and they really like Quarkus. So their reaction was not like you know crazy Java E world, go away with Quarkus, rather than Quarkus is really nice. And then what they also ask me, what is my opinion about Micronode? So there's also an interesting framework, right? So I, so what I think is. For Spring developers, but again, I never, I, I'm, I, ne I never started a Spring project. But my observation is, for Spring developers, uh, this Micronode seems to be more natural than Quarkus. For me, the Micronode is a little bit more complicated than Quarkus. But uh, yeah, this is just a no personal point of view. But Quarkus and Micronode are very similar. From and and by the way, if you would like to hear more about. Micronode, of course, there are, I think, two Airhex FM episodes with the creator, Graham Roche, he also, uh, also created Spring Data, and then, uh, or, or, yeah, ported, uh, or migrated from Grails, the uh, data layer to Spring Data. Okay, so uh, this was the, so I, I think there will be some market share, but uh, we will see later, I, I, I mean, use whatever you like, right? If you use, if you like Spring Boot, go with Spring Boot. Uh, I, I mean, I got so many requests for micro profile Quarkus and the entire ecosystems. I'm there is no need for me to migrate something to Spring. So it really depends, you know, on your eco chamber. I would say. <laughs> okay, now um, we have here the, the chat is crazy, which is really good. Um, so of uh, uh, five nine zero oh, says hello Adam. I'm working with .NET and interested in the Java web space. Very good, interesting. I'm overwhelmed by all the choice. Uh, is there a good path to start with a web server framework database? Your opinion? I would say this is my I hope objective opinion. If you would like to start right now, the easiest possible choice is probably Quarkus, right? Uh, the others can also. I mean, there are lots of, of listeners, so help Mr. 509. So I would say Quarkus is maybe uh, a good starting point. And, and, and currently, Quarkus is also very hot. So you get uh, lots of requests. So if you would like to start, start Quarkus. If you don't like Quarkus, there's another framework very similar called Helidon and, uh, and Micronode. This is what, what I would look, look at. And, um, and yeah. It's interesting that they are overwhelmed with the choices because uh, .NET is also a lot of lots of stuff. So, Mat Matthijs, uh ask me, Hi Adam, I'm currently in a multi-master Postgres cluster. Not bad. Using BDR, what is BDR running? I would like to upgrade to the latest Postgres version, but unfortunately the BDR supporting Postgres is no longer open source. So the question is uh, maybe why it is cut off. Maybe it's too long. Uh, the question is what to do, um, how to tell. But uh, in, in, if you're in the clouds, you could use uh, Aurora. This is a multi-master database in the clouds. Ah, now it comes. Do you have any experience with multi-master bidirectional replication open source databases? Only in the cloud with Aurora. This is primary, primary replication. Um, I never did it uh, myself outside the cloud. But in the cloud, 
Aurora serverless database uh, is able to have a master master application of Postgres compatible databases. So look at that. Um, yeah, and RDS is primary um, is master slave. Okay. Um, sorry for that. Okay. So where are we now? How to tell, right? So. Um, so the market share, yeah, and um, what I see is people are choosing Quarkus to save memory, which is uh, which amuses me because uh, Spring was always, you know, sold as the lightweight solution. At least this was my perception. Everyone said to me, "Why I'm doing Java E because Spring is lightweight," and now it seems like pe uh, people are migrating from Quar from Spring to Quarkus because it, it is it is it is bigger um, or too big. So nothing negative against Spring, of course. Now, a question from YouTube channel. A nice one. So uh, this is uh, so. Um, what I did, I recorded a video about cold start and and lambda. And why I did it, um, there was an there is an ind indirect. The idea come indirectly. So why? So in some project we are using lambda on AWS in Java, and in the um, and developers ask me, you know, should we use Graal to optimize optimize the startup, and um, and you you cannot answer this. I, I will tell you in a second why. And what I also saw that uh, in the internet is Java is too heavyweight as Lambda because the startup times are so bad. So I recorded the video, watch it. So uh, I was um, even surprised how fast it was this time because in 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 my cases sometimes it is like five to ten seconds, and this was like under a second consistently. It's the cold start time. So what's the problem? The cold startup uh, start time. At uh, from from Lam Lambda, uh, it or, or how it Lambda works. So surprisingly, the surprising answer is Lambda works almost like or exactly like EJB stateless pooling. <laughs> no kidding. So what was the idea of EJBs? So EJBs is uh, you could uh, you have multiple threads. You can access the instance once a time. If on a second request, a new instance is going to be created. The more requests you have, the more parallel instances you get. The same is true for lambdas. So imagine you cannot have two threads in a lambda. If another request coming in, another lambda function is going to be started. It's ex exact the same behavior as, as EJBs. So now, why? what's the problem with that, right? So if you're using JVM, straight JVM, the first request is going to be slow, but you are not paying for the initialization. The first 300 milliseconds or whatever, it you you won't get charged for that. What you are paying is for the for for the for the initial Java, I would say cache preloading or whatever. But then, after the request, the lambda is frozen. EGBs were pulled exactly the same, and um, and if the environment is uh, is uh, I would say uh, hibernated, right? Um, and the um, so and then activate it. The Java optimizations are still there. So what it means is, um, if you have a stock JVM, your Lambda gets faster and faster, and a way faster than Node.js or Python. So you will save with Java a real money, which is all about you know clouds are about money. So if you are using Graal VM, the hot startup time is going to be significantly faster. Uh, sorry, the the cold start is going to be faster, like. I don't know, 10 milliseconds, but maybe the subsequent calls are not going are going to be 10% 10 per, 10 slower, let's say. So you will lose 10% of money because the first call, you know, you pay. So, so to optimize Lambda, I would say two questions. Is your Lambda synchronous? Are you using API gateway, you know, to get request response? Or asynchronous. So for the synchronous, it matters somehow because the first user will have to wait one second and the subsequent user get answers in milliseconds. But if this is an asynchronous um, uh, uh, lambda, it's, it, it doesn't matter a lot. And if the uh, lambda is used a lot, there are almost you know, no, no cold starts. Actually, um, I have some lambdas which um, actually statistics of my... Of my um, of the AXFM downloads are implemented with Lambda, and um, the cold starts are, are very, very rare. So I would say it is non-issue, and to optimize, if you really about a cold start optimization, use Mandrel or GraalVM, 
But um, about cost optimization, I mean, I don't think it is worth to do that. If you have a lots of those um, CPU bound, uh, CPU bound um, algorithms going on, uh, I would say maybe just in those straight Coretto is, is easier. And this is what I do in production. So this was about lambdas. So this was the uh, lambdas done. Exactly. So I, I think I missed a question. No. Uh, BC design template was updated. So this is what I started with. So this is already done. How to upload large files chunks in Quarkus app? Is there any library to do this? Of course it is. So it is called multi-part upload. And this is comes ships with uh, Quarkus. It is uh, extension from uh, or extension. It is just uh, REST easy. And this is exactly we we talk about Amazon. So if you have a large files, if you upload the files to S3, uh, huge files, also multi-part is used. I think if there is more than 10 megs or so, it is automatically converted to to multi-part. So this was the answer to the question. So you have to to watch use REST client with. Uh, using REST client with multi-part, if you search for that on Quarkus, you will find that. Okay. Tobias S says, hello, Adam. So hi, Tobias. Welcome back. So uh, hi, Tobias. Wow. This is like, you know, skateboard or what? So it's now, you know, uh, we are... This is this are my, my icons, no, my emojis, and this is yours. So you are far more sophisticated. The question is, can I do something like this with the ASCII, like this? Probably not, you know, with the fingers. So, like, no. Um, Cogito, okay. Uh, the question is, um, what do you what do you think um, of using uh, Cogito with Quarkus to externalize rules? Um, interesting idea. What Cogito is like a, like a rule engine. I mean, if you have such a use case, just go with it. But um, ah, Java rocks emoji, okay. Um, if you um, just go with it, but you know, the, uh, for me, it is rare to have to have the need for state machines. So, if, if I need one, Cogito, I could I would use Cogito or S SCXML. But SCXML has the problem; you know, it is not optimized, and Cogito is any Quarkus extension, which we'll cover in a second. Okay, so. I think uh, covered. The very last question here from, from this, can you explain a little bit more about Quarkus architecture? Is Quarkus same as Java E about request handling model? Thread per request in Java E, which, uh, what is something different about Quarkus and Java E? So I mean, Java E, this is not said that Java E is a thread per request. Um, the application service could do whatever they like. I don't think there is, um, uh, something prescribed how threads are handled in Java E. Um, what, what is something different between Quarkus and Java E? So what I know is that uh, Quarkus, they, um, uh, they re refactored the entire thread and it is always reactive, even if it runs on Jax Res. So um, yeah, that's, that's the difference. But again, uh, Quarkus could implement you know, the entire Java E spec so it, it, it is not like, the question would be, what is the difference between Glassfish or Quarkus or Tomy and Quarkus? This would make sense because Java is just a set of APIs and every application server is different. For instance, Glassfish 3, they have the um, Grizzly kernel, which uh, implemented uh, this, this Comet uh, long polling, which was unique. So um, I would say every application server is different. And I, I think even the JBoss or Whitefly would be very similar to Quarkus in this regard. So uh, this I can, uh, um, but uh, I didn't review the code. This is what I heard about the, uh, the uh, and what I also learned is that they, or learned, um, this was even at Airhex FM, I think, with uh, John Klingen in one of the episodes, that they refactored the uh, threat modeling to be reactive. So um, therefore, they can expose, you know, JAXREST and Mutiny at the same time with the same underlying infrastructure. So, but the other thing is, you also ask me, uh, reactive or non-reactive, what's, what's the deal? I think that the reactive programming uh, is less and less important. Why? 
because we get Project Loom in Java. And what it means is that the virtual threads are becoming very cheap. So what you could can do in the near future is you could start millions of threads and do request response and the JVM will still run fine. And I think this is way more appealing for me than using you know, the reactive programming primitives. So on the other hand, if you have something like event sources, which are reactive, reactive programming is just great. Um, for instance, Kafka streams, I would, they are not reactive, they are declarative and reactive. So if, you, if, you are, if you're using you know, this model, it just makes absolute sense. Or uh, the um, reactive microprofile, I was called uh, uh, um, microprofile reactive uh, extensions, I think uh, reactive messaging. So what you can say, um, I'm receiving this event and exposing in their channel to this event and consuming it again. So what you can do, you can read from Kafka and, and push to SSE, for instance. Um, so th this makes sense for me. But uh, what I never understood is why I should use reactive programming for HTTP. So for me, HTTP is not reactive and uh, reactive makes less sense. But on that note, we had this conversation with the author of Mutiny. And if you search in the uh, podcast um, for Mutiny, and this is uh, Daniel from, um, and this was the, with Clement huh, Escoffier, I think. And he's the creator of uh, Mutiny. I will have to invite him back to talk a little bit more about that. And we had actually uh, a discussion about, you know, Vertex and and uh, and uh, and the idea of Mutiny and Quarkus. So if you like, listen to this episode. I think it is already old, right? Not that old. One year old. So I will have to re-invite. I think it's a good idea, right? I should ping Clement again. Any thoughts on microprofile reactive messaging? I, um, yeah. I have a thoughts on uh, microprofile reactive messaging. Ah, the Brett Tucker is advanced. He he was able to create the Java coffee. So, um, this microprofile reactive messaging, I confuse both specs. I think this is this one with incoming and outgoing annotations, I assume. So this one shines for initial data conversion. In my current project, we get data from Debezium, and Debezium is like a database plugin where every table becomes a stream or topic. And the Debezium comes with extensive uh, metadata and uh, it stores operations or you know whether it is updated, created or deleted. And uh, the problem is this is too much data. So I use uh, microprofile reactive messaging to uh, map the Debezium message to the Debezium class. And then I'm extract whatever I like and write to another topic, which is more you know, without the plum the Bezium plumbing is just, you know, my pure business event and this are using reactive messaging for it. And and then I go with Kafka streams or KSQLDB. Um they are the same basically. Kafka streams you have to implement and KSQLDB is declarative which behind the scenes creates Kafka streams, right? So um okay. Kavat. So how does Quarkus reactive uh, REST reactive mutiny handles request? Is a better cho choice than not reactive? Um, yes, mutiny is better choice if you have to um, many parallel threads. So if you have, let's say, hundreds of par or thousands of parallel requests, in one point of time, Java will die because every thread consumes some memory, and mutiny will able to handle thousands of threads um, or behind the scenes it will only have one this is the secret right so it will have one thread and uh it this is said it can scale better so this is but i i don't have such use cases to be honest so that i know uh thousands of requests are waiting right so um this is the the, the use case for mutiny um what do you think about corcus versus spring boot so um spring boot is fairly old i don't know how old I would say more than five years to 10 years almost, I would say. And Quarkus is very new. And um, what's the differences? I would say the Spring Boot, they always try to be dynamic. So what I remember is they even bought the company behind, behind Groovy and they had their own uh, Groovy language for uh, configuration. And the Quarkus is the opposite. 
So Quarkus is extremely static. So I would say Spring tries to be dynamic and Quarkus have to be static. So this is the opposite uh, architecture almost, I would say. So, and this is what you asked me about the bytecode generations like Gizmo and why Quarkus is doing the, uh, actually what Quarkus is doing is genius. What they are doing is they are reading deployment descriptors and whatever they can with metadata. This is, this is the job of the extension. And they are generating bytecode in advance, in advance, and then the bytecode byte code is started at runtime. But the bytecode is simple. This is not dynamic. Everything is static and pre-cached, -pre pre-optimized, and there's only one single class loader. So um, what, what, uh, what uh, extensions are doing, this is like, you know, the great bytecode simplifier, I would say, an extension. And, um, and this is why Spring Boot, maybe uh, they will have to do a, a, a huge refactoring, you know, to, 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 to refactor the dynamic behavior to static behavior. Um, why does Spring Boot keep being more popular than Quarkus? I would say because, I mean, developers like Spring Boot and there is actually, let's, let's assume you are in a Spring Boot project and you are happy with Spring Boot. Why you should migrate to Quarkus just because it starts a little bit faster and is a little bit smaller, right? I, I would just stick with Spring Boot to say, okay, who cares about Quarkus? Uh, why I should you no know, refact on, on and relearn everything? So it's not not it's not like you know if, if a framework is a little bit better, everyone runs to this direction. I would say Quarkus has to would have to be you know orders of magnitude better than uh, than uh, Quarkus have to be uh, orders of magnitude better than Spring Boot to 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 uh, to, to, to to you know to gain a huge uh, huge attention, but. What I think is uh, the future in the clouds, especially, is uh, actually serverless. And uh, in the serverless environments, you don't need any framework, so you can go pretty far with Pojos. With and picking some libraries will be just just enough. Do you think that this is can change and Quarkus take over Spring? Um, I, I don't. I don't think so. That uh, because you know, if a company invested in Spring Boot. And even if developers would like, you know, to migrate to Quarkus, there's not always budget to do do so. But um, if you would start right now, I, I would say nothing is wrong with Quarkus. I think this is a very nice and complete solution. And um, um, wait a sec, maybe I will find it. JDD Adam Bean. I, I told this story already. Um, this is nice, you know. This is the the reason why I'm right block because I can do these tricks. So that's me. Uh, in, I forgot when, 2011, I think, 2012. And this was last year. So uh, the story was there was a JDD conference in Poland and they invited me last year for an online edition. And I remember that uh, JDD, I know it. And um, I actually was in Krakow 2012. I, uh, and I delivered a talk with the very humble uh, title, Java, a future is now, but is not evenly distributed yet. And um, what I what I started to do, I, I tried you know, to find the source code. And I found it actually on uh, on a folder on my machine still. And then I reviewed the source code and what it was, um, and, and what, what was interesting, so you can actually watch the talk here, if you like, um, that it was pretty modern. So it was actually nine years old, but it looked like, oh, I would write it you know, yesterday almost, uh, you know, there was even producers and what I did there was configuration. You see at the configurator, there was no micro profile config, so I wrote it on stage there. But the but is, um, I, 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 during the another session, I started this on a recent whitefly without any modifications. So I would say the huge power of Quarkus is you can pick your old Java E application and with a few modifications run it on Quarkus. And this makes my clients happy because some of my clients you know they have old application servers and they ask you know, what we can do. And the craziest thing what we did is we we picked an old Java E applications and run it on uh, on Quarkus as a AWS Lambda. So this was you know from from you know German museum technology to uh to uh to uh, almost Alienware, yeah, right? So, um, and uh, this is the nice story. If you if you focus on the APIs like microprofiling in in and and Jakarta E, you can swap runtimes back and forth. So this is lesser true with Micronaut because it's not fully microprofile compatible. But uh, I tell my clients, if you know Red Hat or if you know Quarkus uh, loses momentum and you stop asking me questions about Quarkus and Helidon becomes the ne next great thing. So we can just migrate or migrate. We can just you know, launch our code on Helidon with a minor 
minor improvements. Okay, nice. So uh, let's see what else. What is something different about uh, Quarkus and Java? So on that note, uh, okay, we covered this. This is a post from Jürgen Höhler, a really nice spring committer. And uh, what what this post is about, he wrote uh, Java 17 and Jakarta E9 baseline for Spring Framework 6. So it means that Spring Framework 6 will support Jakarta E9. So, But uh, you say, okay, great news, but this is actually nothing spe special. Um, Spring, uh, wait a second, confirm my choices, okay. Spring always did it, and, and Jürgen uh, um, clarifies that and says in one point, it's not like they, they become a Jakarta E9 server, they are more like Jakarta e e e9 integrator. This was this was just the idea behind. But I have to say, so what I what I tell, told you is the you know uh, where I co uh, where I performed a consulting gig for one of my clients, and they use Spring Boot. And what what turned out that they use JPA, they use actually whatever I used as well. So there was almost no difference between the Spring Boot application and Quarkus application I, I showed them. So whatever I showed them, they said, okay, this is almost identical to us. So I would say, um, if, if you read this, you know, if you have like uh, Jakarta namespace for bin validation, JPA, servlet API, and I would say, then the Spring Boot application will look like uh, Quarkus. And funny, funny thing is, uh, if you have at inject, it was actually invented by Rod Johnson. So um, if you go and Rod Johnson was the original jcp.org, and if you search for, uh, I think it's 330, dependence injection for Java in the year 2009, Rod Johnson and Bob Lee created this pack and they created it at inject. And this was, um, this the idea was to create the new standard. And then Java 6 adopted the standard and Spring just switched to AutoWire, I think. This is not, I think this add inject is not very popular. It is supported by Spring, but it's not like every project uses add inject. So um, I would say um, Quarkus and Spring Boot become more and more popul uh, popular, uh, similar, I would say. And uh, Spring, uh, the distinction, this is what I don't get because. Um, we had a chat with Cumulus, right? And Cumulus implements a lot of microprofile APIs, but it also implements a lot of other APIs like uh, etcd and so forth. So I would Cumulus can also say, no, we are not a Java. They are not Java server. It's more like an integrator. So I would say then is Cumulus very similar to Spring Boot, right? Or uh, uh, let's say uh, Whitefly. Whitefly supports part of a uh, part of SmallRy, exactly what the Quarkus also does, but they also are different APIs. So what I don't get now, what is the difference between integrate Spring Boot as an integration framework and Cumulus, Quarkus, Helidon, and Whitefly? Because Whitefly also uses no SmallRy implementation. It's not like that Whitefly has to implement all the Jakarta e specs by themselves. I assume in Spring Boot, you would use Hibernate as JPA provider. The same does Quarkus. They use JPA provider. Is the no? They use uh, Hibernate. It's not like you, in Quarkus they're using Quarkus JPA provider, and 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 Payara you would use you know Eclipse Link. So um, for me it is not clear w w what is the distinction between being a Jakarta E integrator. But uh, because um, someone I read in in the in the comments and someone asked about that, and he says, uh, wait a sec. Uh, Where was it? So full profile like Tommy. And so in our context, basically, baseline primarily means the minimum version required to run Spring applications. No change in approach otherwise. Spring still considers themselves a framework that integrates with Jakarta infrastructure rather than implementing eSpecs itself. So, uh, but as I said, let's say Quarkus doesn't implement a lot of eSpecs because uh, they pick Smorai or they pick Hibernate or bin validation. Uh, I would say Payara implements some specs, but they also pick, you know, some Smorai. They pick Eclipse Link. And uh, so I don't, uh, Open Liberty the same. So I don't know an application server which implements all these specs by themselves. They always, you know, pick and choose different implementations. The 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 shiny exception is Tommy, where they implement everything from, from or um, also not. They, uh, they're picking, you know, many Apache projects. So I would say, 
maybe I'm, I'm excuse me, wrong, this would be interesting uh, discussion. Uh, actually, all application servers are integrating Java E, but they never implement everything by themselves. Okay. Um, Prashant asked me, what would you recommend for batch applications for Java Cloud? Batch applications for uh, Cloud would be, for instance, AWS Batch. So then you have batch in the cloud, because if you are in the cloud, batching is a, is a service which calls you, so you can do this, or you can use um, just, uh, how it is called, uh, AWS Event Bridge uh, with a cron job or scheduler. It will call you Lambda, this is your batch. Um, or it, there are many, so it's just like, you know, if you go to the cloud, I don't consider the cloud like I will run my Docker container in the cloud, that then cloud doesn't make any sense for me. When then I would use some native services from the cloud, right? Yeah, J Barrett, you could use J Barrett as J Batch. Um, um, the, from, uh, J Barrett comes from, from um, J Boss or Red Hat. So, um, yeah. Bangla Box. He speaks German. We cannot do this. Everyone else spe uh, speaks uh, English. So, bungle box, you have to speak, you know, English. Otherwise, the other ear hackers won't get you. So, but thank you. And uh, got me some positive gimmicks. Oh, of course, gimmicks. Okay, and hopefully not gimmicks. Uh, I think we covered everything. I thought it would be a short episode, but it's not. Uh, yeah, special channel for the long, great community, and the chat is even more fun. I would say with this chat, uh, and you, you will see me in 20 years, right? It's always fun. So I would say, thank you for watching. Uh, um, by the way, uh, what is the where is my you know ads? This is uh, this show is sponsored by AirHex Live. <laughs> so there are already sufficient registrations for the AWS uh, uh, workshop and. Um, in uh, in December, what I also plan in uh, spring, maybe just go crazy and just go with Lambda because I do it a lot right now. It is really easy to create a workshop with that. But um, what what I think what will happen is serverless Java, I will show you that we can actually ditch all the frameworks and just go with Pojos. And um, this is the surprising story. Um, so see you in December, shortly before Christmas. And I would say thank you a lot. See you next time. And uh, right, enjoy, enjoy the autumn, and uh, enjoy spring, Quarkus, Helidon, whatever you have, you know. Enjoy Java, um, and see you next time. Bye.